manifesto for hope. Principle four, without a vision, people perish. Many of our government funded systems are failing the most vulnerable and disadvantaged. At the same time, we're sidelining our greatest national asset, local people. We have a stark choice to keep pouring money into policies we know aren't working or to invest in new and better ways that really improve people's lives. We need a radical reset, one that empowers local charities, grassroots movements and faith groups in a more imaginative, less bureaucratic, more collaborative approach to community development. I'm Steve Chalk. My book, A Manifesto for Hope, sets out 10 tried and tested practical principles for how to develop joined up, cost-effective, community empowering work, each gleaned from the hard-won experience that sat at the heart of my work over the past four decades. It culminates in a call for a new social covenant, one that will transform the life chances of countless young people and families. It's time to reimagine. It's time for a manifesto for hope. Principle four, without a vision, people perish with my guest and expert witness, Steve Parrish, co-owner and chairman of Crystal Palace Football Club. I've grown up loving Crystal Palace. I lived up the road from their stadium as a boy and went to every home match, at least for the second half of the second half, when you could get in for nothing once they opened the gates. I've grown up through my adult years following Palace. And a few years ago, I had the opportunity of getting to know Steve Parrish. We spent an evening together, went out to a bar together, had a great conversation together. And out of that conversation has grown a partnership between Crystal Palace and Oasis, where we supply some of the education to all the young players in the academy. It's a delight to me to be part of a club that I've always followed. For the last 10 years, Palace, who've been up and down the divisions all of my life, have sat stably, well, almost stably, but they've sat in the Premiership. Year after year, 10 years now, into their 11th year. And it's under Steve Parrish's co-ownership and chairmanship that this amazing feat has been achieved. He had the vision, and so far, we've not perished. So it was a delight to sit and talk to Steve. Now, I have to confess, on this occasion, I was charged with recording on my own and turning on the record button. And guess what? Steve was busy, came into the room where we were recording much later than he was hoping. We got into conversation and I suddenly realised we were having the conversation that we should have been recording. So the first few minutes are missing but we pick it up right here. Without a vision, the people perish. I was telling Steve the story of how I once had dinner with Pele. Pele, the great footballer, perhaps the greatest footballer ever, became the patron of Oasis work in Brazil. We worked in Brazil at the time. He was over here in London and he rang me and asked me out for a meal. So the two of us sat in central London together just enjoying one another's company and talking. And one of the things was about Pele and his football. I got him to sign Brazil jerseys for both of my sons. And he told me about the fact that he played football at every conceivable level. I was telling him that both my sons played for their school teams. Every conceivable level, he said, from infant football all the way through to playing for his country and three times winning the World Cup the only player in history ever to do so. And then he told me this. He said, the thing about football is this, at whatever level you play at, you sit with the manager, the team coach before the match. They tell you what to do, where to run, how to pass the ball. They draw things on boards and then you go out and the game starts. And he said, whatever happens, the opposition ends up with the ball, not you. And then you just have to make it up from there. He said, I've realised you just need to keep looking at the goal, 
and aiming towards that goal. As long as you keep the vision of the goal in front of you, you'll make it. Steve explained to me that he too had a shirt signed by Pele and he showed it to me. And then he said that was Pele's genius. He was unpredictable because no one on the pitch, including his teammates, knew what he was doing. That made him so spontaneous and so brilliant. We got into talking about what vision is all about. And that's where we pick up the conversation. I'll say this to get going. I once had dinner with Pele. Pele became the um, ambassador, um, the patron for Oasis in Brazil because we work in other countries, you know. Wow. What was to do with his wife? It, wow. She talked him into it. <laughs> anyway, so I got to know him pretty well. And one um, years ago, he came over here. It, it, it was a World Cup thing and he was, you know, he was always wrapped up in that. And he phoned me up and we went out and had a meal together, just me and him, just sat there. He, he, actually, the funny thing is he signed shirts, Brazil shirts, for both of our boys who were little then, you know. Wow. So, yeah, so I took them home, gave them. One on there, that oh, oh, yeah, you got, there you go, you got one as well. We got two of those. Yeah. And so it says, to Josh, to Daniel, Pele, yeah. you see. So what happens is I take them home, give them to these boys. And they kind of, ah, oh, yeah, chucked them in a heap in their bedroom. Then he was on the telly that summer for the World Cup. All of a sudden, they got them out, ironed them, framed them. And now they're both in their mid-30s and they still got their Pele yeah, chairs brilliant, on them. But anyway, Pele said this to me, he was, he was a character enough. Did you meet him? Did I you? didn't meet him. I went to an event with him, but yeah. I didn't meet him, no. Yeah. Anyway, he said to me one time, Steve, he said, the thing is, I'm the only man in the world who's won the World Cup three times. He said, so I know what I'm talking about. He said, I've played football at every level from little kids all the way to my national team. He said, I've, I've been in the changing room so many times at any level, and you sit there and the, the manager gives you a team talk and draws all over a board, he said. And he got it all sorted. He said, then you go out on the pitch. He said, within 30 seconds, the other team's got the ball. And then he said, you've got to try and make it up from then on. And that's the way he played, wasn't it? That's what made him so good. He was- also, there's a, you have to look forward all the time. If you, if you rest on your laurels, you're going to go backwards very quickly. So it's great that we've done those things. And perhaps I don't lean into that enough and realise the pleasure that Palace fans have had over the last, you know, probably 11, 12 years when we got promoted and, and, and been in the league. But for me, probably the same as you, you know, you don't, look at your 52 schools and think that's great you know you you've got this restlessness you know, yeah the, the, the reason that you've you've achieved all the things you've achieved is you've got a restlessness and it's never been quite enough it's never quite good enough you know and you, you've got to look forward and have your eyes on the horizon and the vision I guess for me for Palace was that in my lifetime I felt it had gone backwards in terms of its relative position against similar teams I often quote that when I was a kid if you went to Highbury and you went to Sellers Park it wasn't that different an experience roll forward 10 years and if you go to the Emirates and you go to Sellers Park, it's a very different experience. And I felt that, you know, it really should be possible to get us back to a position where where we were much more, you know, similar or closer proximity to and, and create a platform where maybe then, you know, in later years, me or somebody could take it even further and you could really level up to that to that place. And, you know, why do you want to do that? I suppose it's rooted in identity and community and something that you loved growing up and you wanted it to be as, as successful as it could possibly be and just being one of those people that doesn't really look for other people to do things you know if you feel that you, you can do something there's a lot of things I can't do anything about you know I wish I could but if you feel that you can do something you know you should try and do it and it isn't as noble a cause as as as, as yours which is you know educating young people and all of the good that you've done, but I think it does have equally hugely peripheral benefits. Oh, you know. Amazing, uh, uh, amazing things for the community. You know, as a, a kid who grew up in Croydon and we run six schools in Croydon, all sorts of things, I know that the presence of a premiership football team in a town like Croydon is an extraordinary thing. It's extraordinary, Steve. I mean, you wouldn't be aware of it, but it is an extraordinary thing. Yeah. I mean, also South London. I mean, there's one Premier League yeah. club in South London. Oh, so, yeah. So I think, you know, we Crystal Palace, there are five boroughs that converge at one roundabout, um, Lambeth, Lewisham, Southwark, Bromley and Croydon. And, 
you know, a million people nearly in Bromley and Croydon alone, training grounds in Bromley, the, the, the grounds in Croydon. So I think South London, I think I often feel is, is does okay on its own. So it's sort of weirdly neglected in some ways. And I think there's nothing that is a beacon of South London, really. There's mm. nothing that, you know, the Crystal Palace once was and, and, and trying to carry that baton forward. So what's, you know, I talk in my chapter about a true north. What is it that gets you out of bed and keeps you going, especially in what you're doing? Because last week we lost. We got a tough game this weekend, haven't we? So how do you deal with that constant up and down and stay stay true? Well, so you're having a North Star, as I call it, is is what you have to anchor to, right? So you've got a long-term plan for the club. But obviously, again, in football, that can be knocked off course with relegation, really. I mean, that's the big spectre for us. So you develop a lot of mental strategies in term, in to keep you on track. I remember at the beginning, you know, when we were relegation threatened in the championship in the first year, it's very hard to come in and think about strategies for ticketing and strategies for retail food and strategies for merchandising when you'd lost on a Saturday and you were staring in the abyss of maybe League One for the first time in, in, in 40 years. But you you ha- you realise that that normality actually helps everybody. When there are difficult times and we have our management meetings, I always say, because what I've learned about sport is it's a process. Unlike in business, often you can control outcomes. You, you, you get that preeminent a position in business that you you know as a company that often you can you really can you know what your outcome is going to be pretty much whereas in sport luck plays a big part and you can only control the process and if there's a contributor to the morale of the team is to be a part of that process to not go down the black hole when you lose or get overly euphoric either when you win but to try as much as possible to stay on a level and cause what helps you i think are two things First of all, I think what I find really helpful is to look at your worst day and stare it down, right? So what's the, you know, what is taking my mind away from my North Star, from my goal? What is distracting me? What is the fear? Articulate that fear. What is it? You know, how does that look if it actually happens? How are you going to deal with it? Plan for the worst day and then try and build in a margin of safety to avoid that. So how do I actually avoid that? And then once you've come to terms with it, And you've dealt with it in a kind of forward-looking vision. You know, this is my worst day. This is how I'm not going to allow it to set me off course. This is why my North Star is still important because that might be a bump in the road, but, you know, I still intend to get there. So how am I going to deal with that? And once you've got a plan of how you deal with that, you can block that in a box and then you don't have to keep revisiting every time that spectre because it's the the fear of the unknown that that you're dealing with and, oh, this is all pointless because if that happens, then we won't be able to do it. And then it's a fantastic thing, I think, sport f- for life to help you cope with life because it, it really is life laid bare. In business, it's very rare that you fail so publicly and you succeed so publicly. And keeping your feet on the ground when everybody's saying, you know, you know you're, we've been in periods where, you know, the most exciting team in the division and it's going to challenge and, or you're going to get into FA Cup finals and you start believing in, you know, that you're going to win every game. And equally, you know, you could be in moments where you, you can't see the next win. And, 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 and so helping you keep on a level when you've got those two massive extremes that most people don't encounter in their life, you know, it is more extreme on a weekly basis than you're encountering most things you're doing, is in the long run is good for you. In the, in the short term, it's really hard to cope with at the beginning. And anybody that's in sport, I think will, will, in any way will tell you that. And what you do is not just lead, but you hold a whole team together. In fact, Palace is well known, isn't it, for its supporters. It's just extraordinary. What have you learned about holding a team together? Because it's a leader that holds a team together. And by the team, I don't just mean the players. I mean the, the whole setup. Well, I think, first of all, we're very fortunate. I think going into situations where you feel that's possible you can always go into a situation where it's just impossible to do that. So one of the things that, that, that's always kept me close to the club and, and drew me to it in the first place would be the supporter base and, you know, everything they've been through 
and how staunch they are in terms of their real true understanding of what supporting a club is. So I think that's a two-way street in a lot of ways. I don't think that that's, a, that's, that's one-way traffic. You know, I think that you've got to put yourself into situations. You can have a vision, you can have a North Star, but it's got to be achievable. You've got to believe that you can achieve it. I mean, anybody can dream, you know, dream a dream and just say, this is my vision and I'm, I'm, I'm going to do it. But if it's not practically achievable in any way, shape or form. But, but when, um, when rebuilding the club back at its, you know, original base, 1905 base, when it started at Crystal Palace, the Crystal Palace, when that didn't become possible, your vision drove you well, the to vision, looking at it vi- different ways. The vision was the club needs much better infrastructure. The vision wasn't the club has to be at Crystal Palace. The vision was it needs much better infrastructure. What's the best way of achieving that? What's the easiest route? What's the fastest route? When we looked at Crystal Palace, you know, planning-wise, it's just very tricky up there. I think it might have got easier now because there's more of a, you know, the, the stadium's nearly derelict and I think more people want to do something with it. But I think it's it's always a bigger challenge to move a stadium where you've got, you know, transport infrastructure and people used to the parking and they're used to all the upheaval of a match day than, than to, to move it to somewhere new, particularly in a densely populated area like this Crystal Palace Triangle. So that wasn't the vision. The vision was we need to improve the infrastructure of the club. We need to improve the, the, the match day revenue. We need something that, we can all be proud of, you know, a stadium. We can all be proud. Yeah, of. that was a that was a way of a way to the vision. And when it didn't work, yeah, we found another. Way. I mean, obviously, in most business endeavours, if you're going to be successful, it's a game of trial and error, snakes and ladders. Really, I mean, if anybody thinks that you do anything, I mean, that there are probably tales, aren't there? Where where I mean, I guess even if you look spoke to people about things like Facebook and. I mean, I remember seeing something about YouTube and it pivoted about four times into, into what it was, yeah. right? You're always going to go down rabbit holes. and, and Yeah. And- well, I, I, um, I was talking to the bosses of one of the big um, global um, accounting companies, one of the big four. They invited me in to talk to them about strategy. And this is post-COVID. And I said, I don't think there's a company in the world who's ever seen their three, five or 10 year strategy fulfilled. They always get blown off course, but it's that vision that drives them. And I could see they were thinking about it. So I said to them, so what was your strategy and your plan and your vision before COVID? And are you doing it now? And they all laughed because in actual fact, the war in Ukraine, COVID changed the world completely, didn't it? It changed the interest rate. It changed the cost of living. And even if you're a global player, you had to adapt and find a new way through. Yeah. And I think probably in that case, it maybe changed some people's vision of what they wanted out of their life. So it it maybe did change some people's North Star. For me, it's just changed the route slightly. You know, I might do more Zooms than than physical meetings, right? But it hasn't changed what I want to try and... Achieve. It's difficult to talk about it because the North Star is probably for the club to be as big as it could possibly ever be ever, right? So that's a far, it's an infinite road. You know, it, does, it, doesn't, it doesn't have a, an end. And I think what, what tends to happen is because if you set achievable visions as they, as they appear on the horizon, then you yeah. move the vision, right? And you yeah. go off. Right? So yeah. I think there's something about people like you where I don't suppose you actually – when you in 14 years old, that great story you've told me, when you decided that you wanted to start a refuge for women in schools and, and, and all of these things, I don't suppose you ever thought you'd have 52 schools. And, you know, you didn't think that at the time. But now as you sit there, you're restless for, you know, the youth centre that you're building, you're, you're, you know, you're the book, the wonderful book that you've written, you, you know, you're, you're, you're committed to really making a difference, a bigger difference to young people's lives and the problems have probably exploded from when you started out at 14, you know, because you didn't have knife crime and you didn't have terrible tragedies. So, but it's still the same big vision. You want to make the lives of young people better. It's just that elephant's got bigger, right? Yeah, yeah. And you go past stepping stones, things that were once difficult, you've done, and then you don't even realise they've happened because now you're drawn on to something else. Speaking of education, though, I think um, when we first met, in a, that bar in Soho, and you talked about your vision for young people. And when you said that, I've never said this, you've never had a chance to say it to you before, 
I realised that for you, it was much bigger than just being the greatest football team on earth. It was about giving young people a, an opportunity in a future, whether it's on or off the pitch, which is what brought us together, really, wasn't yes, it? Yeah, education. Yeah. yeah, and you, I mean, you told me that incredible um, thesis that you have, you know, about learnt behaviour and neural pathways and, and young people that are grow up in more disadvantaged backgrounds, not having that learnt behaviour to deal with situations and then getting overloaded and, and, and lashing out maybe and trying to divert attention because they're not used to dealing with those situations. That was probably one of the most informative, I mean, you lent into 30 years, I don't date you too much, 35 years of, of experience of, of working with young people. I knew that we could do something more for the boys that we had in our care, for the, for the, with the foundation touched people in the community. I didn't really understand practically how you did that. I remember talking to the foundation, they're now Palace for Life, and saying, look, these, these events we do are great and they raise awareness, but I want to really try and make a difference. How do we make a difference? Which, you know, led to uh, schemes like Diver, you know, being a, a, it wasn't our idea of a scheme, but it, it being, getting preeminence, you know, where we're going into custody centres, there are people that have come in at first defence with a knife at 16 years old and they don't want to talk to a policeman or a figure of authority, but a coach or a, somebody with a Crystal Palace badge. And then extending, you know, what you showed me into the academy and understanding that for a lot of our boys, that the most comfortable they are in the world is when they're on a football pitch. All the challenges of success come with the demands and the things that they're faced off the football pitch that they're far less equipped for because not all in all cases, but in some cases, they just don't have the learned behaviour. And now, going forwards, just even more simplistic things, which is the power of football to get young people out and enjoying physical activity and not sitting on iPads and, you know, playing computer games and, and, and that kind of thing. So it, it kind of ladders up from a very simplistic level of just the whole getting kids out, playing sport, boys, girls, playing football, take my six-year-old, you know, on, on a Sunday and anybody who says football isn't popular as, as it was amongst young kids, I mean, it's the number one thing I think you can get boys and girls out in, into the sunshine, into the cold air to actually enjoy physical activity rather than, unfortunately, being too addicted to devices and phones, as you know, as, as we're all prone to be. Laddering up through teamwork, you know, keeping people off the streets and out of areas of danger for them and diversionary tactics that could take them into bad things. And then up into making them uh, more open to being educated, more open to being mentored, you know, where we can help them psychologically to cope with the things in their life that maybe in some instances they're not fortunate enough to learn at home. So I, I came into it thinking we could do a bit of good. And then I met you and I realised just how much good, you know, we could do and how much football could be a power to touch people's lives and how much football was a leading to physical activity, which is so important now for so many young people, which obviously has a huge impact on health, which can save us money in the health service. And, you know, it's just a massively virtuous um, circle being involved. And, and, and thanks to you, on a micro level at the, the education programme, I mean, you know, every uh, kid 16 to 18 that's in our academy got at least two A-levels. We're getting fantastic GCSE results, thanks to the people that you've got in the academy that work with the boys. But more importantly, the confidence of the boys that I see from four or five years ago when we had port cabins and waterlogged pitches and they went to just their normal schools. Um, first of all, I think we're giving them a nice place. They see nice things. They respond to it in a way. They've got people being open and positive and helpful towards them. And then they've got just these layers of people to talk to them, teachers, mentors, ex-players, um, and then expanding that out to the community and the women's team and the disabled team and what the facility can do. So it's been a great journey and, 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 and meeting you has been so pivotal on that journey because of your insights that you can give me of 35 years of, of pursuing your vision and your innate understanding of how you turn young people around. I mean, when I go to the school in Lambeth, your auction night, and, you know, I can't remember the stat you gave me, but there's as many people, kids now gone to Oxford and Cambridge that had been excluded from that school before you, you, you took over. I mean, it, it just shows you that it's nurture, right? So much of life is nurture, you know, to, to, to write people off as bad, which is what your big thing is. And, you know, it's just 
wrong and the way that we deal with it is so obviously wrong once you explain it. You know, the more incapable somebody is of dealing with the things that you're putting in front of them, you know, we introduce more discipline and more severe punishments and it just isn't a way forward. You know, you need to teach them the behaviour to deal with those difficult situations in order for them to, to grow. And that's been something that we put into the academy thanks to you. And you know my goal, I think, when we started, where we probably connected, was I said to you, look, most of the kids are not going to make it as professional footballers. But what we must do is we must leave them as better young people. And we must, they must look back at it and say, as many as possible. I mean, you, you, I suppose you're never going to please everybody. Some people are friendly to be disappointed they didn't make it as a footballer, I guess. But we definitely want to as many as possible to look in the rearview mirror and go, I didn't make it as a footballer or I did and that was great, but I didn't. And it's, but it was the thing that changed my life. I'm so pleased I was in that place. I got a great education. I played football. I learned teamwork. You know, I was in this thing called Oasis Academy that did amazing things for me. And I'm a much better person because I was in that academy. That's really the aim. And then all the peripheral benefits to the, to the wider community. And that's very much, you know, you've encapsulated all the stories that you told me that day in, in the bar or written in the book for other people to, to learn from. The way I always think of it, it's like um, an acorn. Every acorn, however, however small, has got the potential to become an oak tree. But it's dependent on being placed in good soil and good irrigation and good nutrition. And, be, and for want of that, some acorns never make it to what they could be so it's that environment isn't it and i think steve you're very kind to me but i genuinely do think that it's your vision that creates that soil and when i come in and i meet the young players their politeness is extraordinary now i know that's a good asset isn't it you want a polite player not an angry one but you've created the soil and the environment for them to grow in what I, what I wanted to ask you about was loneliness, because before you were talking about, you know, this isn't like business, you know, your successes are out in public and the failures, you know, are, it's all laid bare for everyone, isn't it? There's a loneliness in being the chairman, the leader, isn't there? There is and there isn't. I mean, I think that anything you know your public job you get the plaudits you take the bullets you know I mean I think that I've got good people around me you know we've got a good team of people plenty of people that I can chat to and 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 share problems with I mean I don't I don't do this on my own you know you, you when, when, if you create a vision from that vision you create a culture that that you think is the best culture to deliver it and then, you know, you, you, you get good people that, that, that are part of that culture. They believe in that culture. They believe in the North Star. And then, you, you know, you really, you're on a shared journey, whether that's with our partners like Oasis, whether that's with Dougie Freeman, the sporting director, or Sharon Lacey, the operations director, or Sean, who's the finance director, or, or Barry, who's the commercial director, or James, who's the marketing director. You know, these are people that are, you know, on that shared journey, you know, it's not, it's not a secret journey. We all know what we're trying to achieve and everybody believes that that's the right thing for the club. And, and obviously then you, you, with the, with the supporters as well, you're trying to keep them on board on that shared journey. Of course, some supporters would gamble more for short term sporting merit. And, and you have to constantly explain why, you know, you think that the, the trajectory you're on is the right thing. It doesn't mean it will end right. You know, it's not without risk, you know, and, but I do believe that that one season of exceptional sporting performance and then, you know, we've seen it before with some clubs, years in the wilderness, is not as good as creating a solid foundation and a platform where it may be that the next people are the people that, that win the trophies. And, uh, you know, and I'm an eight-year-old, 9 year old fan on the terraces, let's hope. Um, uh, that may be what happens, but I do think that it's the right trajectory for the club if you love the club and you put the club as the hero, you know, and, and, and so when you talk about the loneliness of the journey, I'm, I'm, I'm on it with the supporters that whenever I see them, you know, no matter what you might see on social media, whenever I meet supporters of the club, they're so on board and they're so supported by far the vast majority of them. Um, the people that, you know, work with me for the club, my partners, Josh, David, John, 
are on board with the vision. It's a shared vision. So you, you, I don't think you're lonely in those circumstances. Of course, there are moments, you know, but then you've got your family and, 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 and your loved ones and, and, and those people that can, can help you forget it. So, you know, it's all about perspective, right? In the end, it's all about perspective. You know, we are, you know, in, in, in 200 years, right? Who's going to remember the problem that you're worrying about today, right? No one's going to remember the problem. You know, you're lucky if they remember your name. So I think it's all about trying to keep a perspective. It's very hard because we all get lost in today's thoughts and today's problems. And, uh, you know, there's I don't go in much for kind of self-help things and things that other people do to get them around it because I think what they've done is they've spent a long time working it out and they found things that work for them and I think it's very difficult to try and do stuff that works for somebody else you know if it's not innate in you but I think there are some strategies and I can't credit you know the people that have said it because then so they come at you so thick and fast with social media but one of the things that I think is is great is, you know, before you go to bed at night, is to think about all the good things that happened that day, all the positive things that happened that day or that week, the things that have made you smile, the things that have made you happy. Because there's always stuff, there's always something. You know, you can always, if you focus on the negative in, in catastrophize, which we've all done in our lives, you know, we've all, I'm sure we've all been in that situation, that sort of sackcloth and ashes where you're drawn to the, you know, I'm, I've done, you know, we, we lost, it's all my fault. Let me try and find all the stuff that says that I'm useless. And, you know, you, you, you learn that it's not a healthy place to be, you know, lean into the positive stuff. Think about the positive stuff. Think about all the things that have gone well. Forget all the things that have gone bad. You can't change them. And just try and plow on with the North Star, which, which is the important thing. And if you do that as well, I think it becomes very functional to how you operate. You know, there's that old again another analogy somebody used does it make the boat go faster right you know i always live by that one right you know i think it was it, it's a sporting team somewhere that i think it was um red gray right yeah you know so they, they honed all their training down to right you yeah. know because you've got lots of people saying do this or do that or you know and he was like okay does it make the, is it going to make the boat go faster because if you're not going to make the boat go faster, we're trying to win an Olympic medal. Why are we doing it, right? So again, you do hear these little sound bites. I think that often they guide you back to things that you believe innately, but they amplify them and they reinforce them. That that is yeah. you you latch onto that, but you've got to latch onto it all the time. Yeah. Well, here's a here's a story for you from another sport. A strange thing happened to me. I had to go to New Zealand because they were launching some new schools, working with Pacifico kids, as they call them, kids from the islands who uh, are uh, around New Zealand who drop out of education very often. So I was invited across this, uh, this nine, nine, ten years ago. And um, I went, I did some stuff for the government. Then I went to, uh, I went to see one of these schools developing. And it was led by this wonderful um, Pacifico woman. And we got chatting and, and, she, and we got chatting about sport. And she said, uh, do you like rugby? And I said, well, I used to play a bit of rugby. Football was really my thing. But I did play rugby on the wing because I, was no, I didn't like getting beaten up in the middle. But I knew that on the wing, you rarely get beaten up. And when you got the ball, you just ran. And you got all the glory without any of the bent ears. And she said, oh, she said, my cousin... He, he used to play football. He used to play rugby on the wing as well. He, he, he used to play a bit of rugby. And he, anyway, we got on really well. And she said to me, hey, why don't we get, to get together tonight? I don't think my cousin's doing anything so that we could go out, the three of us, for the evening and, and just talk about rugby. So I pitched up at this place and her cousin came and his name was Joe Nalomu. It was just unbelievable. A great player. Yeah, well, they always say the best player in the world. But here's what he said to me. We had a great conversation. And we was started talking about... Underwood? Was it steamrolled? Was it, was yeah, it in that yeah. First yeah. minute, was just, it ran straight just, over him. Just ran over him. And, yeah. it, anyway, but he told me this thing. This is a really interesting thing. He said, you've never seen me swap shirts with anyone at the end of a match. I didn't know I'd never seen him do that. But he said it's because it's like this. He said, he said, when we play as the All Blacks, he said, you sit in the changing room until your number's called and then you go to the jersey room. And he said, you go there on your own. 
and you can and your the jerseys are set out on the chair and he said you look at your number and there it is all folded up and he said you stop and this is what Jonah says to me he says you thank God that you have the opportunity of wearing that famous jersey on this day and then you pick it up and you put it on and your whole job is to move the reputation of the jersey forward. And you go out and play, and he said, and at the end of the match, you come back in, and you go back to the jersey room, and you take the jersey off, and you put it back on the chair for whoever plays in it in the future. And then he said, the whole job is to move the jersey forward. Same sort of principle, isn't it? You know, that's... that's so such a good story and 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 so relevant to my job at, at crystal palace you said 1905 obviously the club's been going since 1861 in in from the crystal palace company and you know the only thing you know about a football club is is that you won't be the last person there so obviously you have that job and i remember you know when we talk about the mental strategies and worrying you know i remember the relegation threatened and it was christmas time i think we were playing Manchester City at home, which is obviously, you know, you, you don't think of it as a natural three-pointer. And I, down in the manager's room, in a sort of state of, you know, nervousness and unrest and, and worry. And it, there was a roll call on the television of people that had passed away. I think it was it might be New Year's. And I, I, terrible, I, I can't remember the gentleman's name, but there was an NFL presenter that had passed away. Young guy, you know, 40s, I would guess. And it, I just, I literally had an epiphany. This is playing Manchester City <laughs> at home on New Year's Day or whenever it was. We're alive. What, what would I have, you know, as a young boy, what would I have given to have been in this situation? How am I not enjoying this moment? How am I looking at this moment <laughs> as, as, as something fretful or fearful or, you know, something to not be enjoyed? You know, why, why can't I just live in it? We're playing Man City. At Crystal Palace Sellers Park. You know, when I started out, if somebody said you'd just taken that, you know, as, as a as a in the Premier League. So everybody says, or a lot of people say, you know, you can't run your life relative to other people. You know, we know there are people starving in the world, and of course we care about it, but you, you don't get up every day and feel as thankful as you should for that, you know. But I do think that every day you can get a perspective out of how fortunate you are compared to the alternatives, you know, and um, I think you're right. The, 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 the North Star for me is to make this thing better than I found it, to pass it on to the next person in a better condition, to let it continue giving joy to people in the community, you know, people in globally as well, you know. I'm sure people get a lot of joy from it. So, that, so that's the job. And, I mean, you know, tr trying to enjoy every minute of it is really the, 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 the personal challenge. And realise what a privilege it is to be doing it and how many money, amazing people you come into contact with. We beat Monaco under 21 last night. I was there. The boys' faces were just unbelievable and the joy. And Nathan Ferguson played his first 90 minutes having come back from injury for, you know, and, and, and that's the side that you've got to get in touch with. All the, you know, your friends and the human stories and, and the, the things that you see people overcome and, you know, all that backdrop and, and being part of our little community, which is the people in the club. I'm focusing as much on that as as well as the as the big picture and things that you can get joy from, you know, every day and go to bed every night thinking about those ten things that 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 worked well for you that day that made you happy and not focusing on the just discarding the stuff that that didn't. Steve, without a vision, the people perish. That's why Palace going somewhere. There's a vision. Thank you so much. Pleasure. Been brilliant. Really enjoyed it. <laughs>